Hey guys, it's Sarah, and today I have a little bit of an experiment for you guys. I saw a trend going around the beauty side of YouTube. Basically, people were purchasing the lowest rated items on Ulta and Sephora and trying them out and seeing why they were rated so low, what was so bad about that makeup, and it got me thinking, what are the lowest rated books on Goodreads? Obviously, it would be hard to just kind of do that search off the top of my head, so I used the list feature on Goodreads. Goodreads basically has this feature where people make lists of different types of things, like if you're looking for YA contemporary books, like there'll be a list for that or fantasy or whatever. They just have this thing called Listopia and you can basically go in and see lists. How many times can I say list in one video? My quest brought me across a list called the worst rated books on Goodreads. Essentially for a book to qualify for that list, they have to have below a three rating. Apparently that's very low on Goodreads. Most books have above a three. What I will say about this list is it didn't really account for how many ratings or reviews a book had. Basically, if it just has below a 3.0, it could have like two ratings and still be on the list. So I don't really know math, but I feel like in order to get a gist of what people on Goodreads really are thinking are the worst books ever, you have to maybe look at a book that has tons and tons and tons of ratings and reviews and still has a very low rating because math and like percentages and fractions and stuff. So the criteria I set for this experiment was picking books that had over 15,000 reviews because again, I think based on math that would mean that them having such a low score would be kind of like a lot of people read it but it's still so low. I'm still not explaining this math concept very well, but hopefully you're you're with me. I don't really understand how to explain math, but I just felt like the more reviews you have, if you still have a very low rating, that means there's quite a few people not enjoying your book. So this criteria that I set for the experiment led me to five books, but one of them was a sequel to The Devil Wears Prada series. I've seen the movie with Meryl Streep, but I've never read the book, and I didn't want to force myself to have to read the first book to read the second book, so that book was out the door. So I narrowed it down to four books, and so what I did for this experiment was I went ahead and I read them. So the first book I read for this challenge was The Almost Moon by Alice Sebold. For those of you familiar with this author, she also wrote The Lovely Bones, which is not only a critically acclaimed book, but also a movie starring Saoirse Ronan. From what I know, that's a lot of people's like favorite book of all time, so I was very, very surprised to see that this book was on the list. The Almost Moon has almost 32,000 reviews and it has a 2.67 rating. 18% of those ratings are one star ratings. This book centers around a woman named Helen, who I believe is in her 40s. Her whole life, she's had a very complicated relationship with her mother, and at the very start of the novel, like the very first sentence, she admits to readers that she has murdered her mother. And so basically the novel just kind of delves into why she murdered her mother, how she murdered her mother. Basically, she's been caring for her for many years because her mother has dementia, and it's just a very um, complicated, weird story from there. To say that this book was unsettling and not good would be to say the least, I think. This is one of those books where you think to yourself, why would someone want to write this? What possessed them? What brought this upon them? What in their life told them that this was a story you should read? Now don't get me wrong, Alice Sebold's writing style was great. I feel like her writing is very compelling. The way she says things is very honest and very raw, and she doesn't really like shy away from saying things that would make you uncomfortable, which I appreciate those things. I like to read a lot of thrillers that have that similar writing style, and so I liked that, and I can almost see why people really like The Lovely Bones, but there was just so much about the character of Helen and her life and just elements of the story that led me to just really hate this book. And don't get me wrong, like I said, I'm super into dark, fucked up stories. I'm here for a good daughter kills her mother story. I, that, that's not the problem. But for me, this book was more just dismal and sad. It just kind of felt like a wet blanket of a book. Helen is a bit of a miserable person and all the narrative did was just kind of keep confirming that she had a terrible childhood and that her mom had some mental illness issues that went unchecked her whole life. Her mom had agoraphobia as well as potentially bipolar disorder. It doesn't really go into detail about what was going on with her mom, but her mom just did and said a lot of things that aren't too great. And so Helen obviously uh, was neglected because of that and had some bad experiences growing up. What was weird about this book was that I just am not really sure what Sebold was going for. I feel like we were meant to feel bad for Helen for having such a bad life, but then at the same time, she was such a miserable and like mean person that I had a hard time feeling bad for her. And then part of me was like, are we supposed to feel bad for her mother because of her mother's mental illness? 
but then I had a hard time doing that too. And her mother's mental illness was extremely vilified throughout the book. Like it was just very like looked down upon and Helen just like hated her mother to a degree. And then there's a lot about Helen's father as well who died before the novel starts. When you go back into the memories, you kind of see what her dad was like. And he also struggled with mental illness. There's even a scene where Helen has an experience with her father where she realizes that he attempted suicide at some point when she was a child. And instead of vilifying his mental illness the way she does with her mother, she's just kind of like, it's not his fault. So it was just like really weird how she was dealing with mental illness in the story. And then obviously I think Helen had some of her own issues and everything just felt unchecked and sort of like confusing. And Helen even talks about having tried to go to therapy, but how she just like thought the shrink was a quack and like didn't like him. Um, Helen just makes a lot of weird decisions on how to deal with having murdered her mother. The only person she tells is her ex-husband and she sleeps with her best friend's like 25 year old son. And that scene was just really weird. I, I don't really know what to feel about this book because I like morally gray characters. I like people who make bad decisions. Like I like that in books. So it really wasn't a matter of just not liking an unlikable character. It was more so just like, I don't like Helen and I don't like the things she did or, and I just didn't understand her motivations. So this book was just really confusing. Again, like I like to think of books as something that the author felt they needed to tell. And I'm just not sure why she wanted to tell this story. Again, don't get me wrong, I think Sibold is a very good writer in the sense of her writing style. I definitely would be interested in reading The Lovely Bones, but um, I gave this book one star, so I contributed to those one star reviews. And I'd have to say uh, Goodreads had it on this one. It definitely deserves the rating that it has and it should be on this list of worst books on Goodreads, I think. I'm sure you could find a book that better encapsulates a dark family dynamic that explores mental illness and how it affects yourself and everyone around you. It didn't go over that well in this book, so I definitely recommend spending your time on something else. After I finished The Almost Moon, I said to myself, they surely can't get worse than this. There's no way that these books could be this bad. You don't understand. Like I wasn't going into this trying to hate on these books. I just wanted to find out scientifically whether or not Goodreads reviews to some degree were trustworthy, because I think we've had a lot of discussions surrounding this topic in the past. There's a lot of occasions where people rate books on Goodreads that they haven't read, or people don't find star ratings to be very reliable. So I was just like, is it true? Are these books bad? And so after The Almost Moon, I was like, it's gotta go up from here. There's gotta be one book that I really enjoy. And so the next book I read was Pygmy by Chuck Palahniuk. This is another author that you probably are familiar with. He wrote Fight Club, which was also a very famous movie with Brad Pitt and Edward Norton. From what I've heard of Palahniuk and also from what I've seen in Fight Club, I knew his writing style was gonna be gritty. Like I knew it was gonna be all about the shock value and making you feel weird and question things because like I said, I've seen the film and I've heard about him as an author. So I was prepared to a degree. But then as I read Pygmy, I realized I actually wasn't prepared to any degree. <laughs> all I can really say to this book is what the literal fuck did I just read? Pygmy has almost 24,000 reviews and ratings and it has an average rating of 2.96 with 13% of those being one star reviews. From my understanding, this book centers around a young boy who is from some sort of communist country and is a spy. And he and a group of other youths come to the US as foreign exchange students and stay with families. But they actually are, like I said, spies and they have commands from the government to infiltrate the US or something like that. The main character who doesn't really have a name, everyone calls him Pygmy, but I don't think that's actually his name, tells the story in broken English. And there's a lot of things that are redacted and sort of, it's like told as if it was like a spy log. All of that sounds fine, but the broken English part is actually really offensive because it kind of gives the impression that he's from a sort of Asian country and he speaks English in that way that's almost like making fun of someone who's Asian trying to speak English. And what's weird to me about that too is that if he's supposed to be this like highly trained operative from a communist country, I feel like he would be able to tell the story completely normal. So I'm very confused about why Chuck Palahniuk chose to tell the story in such a way. His country of origin is never really revealed as the story goes on. I feel like that's something that makes it almost even more 
uncomfortable and honestly racist. I'm gonna be upfront. This book feels very, very racist. Pygmy never even really describes himself. The only way I was able to pick up what he looked like and maybe assume that he might be Asian was because of how people were describing him. There were so many racial slurs. Other side characters just called him so many racist things. Honestly, even him going by the name Pygmy is racist. I looked up what the word meant and it means a member of certain peoples of very short stature and equatorial Africa and parts of Southeast Asia. Also, Pygmy is essentially a terrorist because their big operative mission in coming to the US is to set off a bomb in Washington DC as sort of like a terrorist act, which is so stereotypical. Like I, I, ugh, ugh, I've got no words for this. And don't worry, if you thought it couldn't get any worse from it just being blatantly racist, it's also extremely sexist. One of Pygmy's side goals is to impregnate an American woman. And so he constantly is looking around at women and judging their, I guess, breeding abilities. He often refers to them as receptacles for his seed, which is really gross. Pretty much all the men in this novel treat the women with little to no respect. There is no shortage of slang terms for women's breasts in this book. Like I said, I knew that Polonek's writing style was meant to be very shocking, but there were so many things in this book that felt like they were written in just to make you feel uncomfortable, like just for the sake of it, not really to do anything to move the story along, but just to make you feel so weird inside. Like there is this scene in the beginning of the novel where they go to Walmart. Pygmy ends up having this confrontation with the school bully because he's like a secret spy operative. He's really good at fighting and he ends up not only severely hurting the bully, but he also sodomizes him. And you, you didn't mishear me. He sodomizes him. And it's just such a weird scene and it makes you so uncomfortable. You're just like, what did I just read? Um, what? He even comments on that it was a waste of his seed to do that to the bully. And then the bully later comes to him and confesses his love for Pygmy because he's been like secretly gay, which I think is like a weird mistreatment of like LGBT themes. I don't really know how else to describe this book. I know I'm giving away a lot of stuff that happens in this book, but I like urge you not to read this book because it made me so angry. Like I was literally like, what the fuck? There's another scene where they're at the dinner table and he drugs his host family and he removes a vibrator from his host mother's vagina. I don't know why she just had a vibrator chilling up there, but like I couldn't even make this stuff up. It literally sounds like I'm making things up, but that is literally what is in this book. It's so confusing. It makes me so uncomfortable. I actually didn't read, I think the last like 20 pages because I was just like so uncomfortable and I had gotten enough of a gist to know whether or not this was a good book. It just is weird and I feel like it for no reason at all like perpetuates some like racist things or slurs, there's sexism, there's weird sodomy in it. I, I don't even really know how else to describe this book. Again, I thought after The Almost Moon that they just couldn't get worse. It, it went even lower and I didn't even know that they could go so low. So after those two books, as, as you can see, um, I wasn't having a great time, but I thought again, it can't be this bad. Like again, Goodreads is not the end all be all. Like there's so many people who have different opinions in the world. I still think that's true, but the next book did not help me out either. Spoiler alert. The next book on my list was The Emperor's Children by Claire Massoud. I have never heard of this author, so I have no pop culture reference to give you for this. I just, it was just a random book that was on the list and I was like, okay, I'll read it. This book has over 18,000 reviews and ratings with an average rating of 2.94, with 11% of those being one star ratings. This book takes place in 2001 in New York City and it follows a handful of characters who are all connected for different reasons. One of them is named Marina Thwaite. She is a Brown graduate and she has had a book deal for many years and she just hasn't gotten around to writing her book. And her father is a very renowned journalist named Murray Thwaite. And so a lot of her prestige comes because of her father and who he is and the different things that he's written over his lifetime. Another character is Danielle, who is one of Marina's friends from college. And Danielle works as like a sort of like TV producer person. And so she's kind of like traveling through life, not really knowing what she's doing. Another character is named Booty. You heard me right, his name is Booty. His real name is Frederick, but they call him Booty. I'll get into that in a bit. And he is, I believe, 18 or 19, and he doesn't really believe in higher education, but is extremely smart and wants to just sort of like pursue his intellect. And so he is actually Marie's nephew. And so he wants to come to New York and like live with Murray. And then there's a few other characters that I'll talk about as I talk about the book, but that's basically the gist of the story. Um, there's really not a lot that happens in this book. So just know that it's about really pretentious people living in New York City in 2001. After reading this book, I think if you were to go to the dictionary and look up the word pretentious, there would be a photo 
of this author holding this book. Apparently when this book came out, it was on the New York Times bestseller list and a lot of people were giving it a lot of literary acclaim and saying it was really great and everybody should read it. So I noticed in a lot of the Goodreads reviews that people were commenting on that and kind of questioning why it was on the list. I have to agree with a lot of what people said. So let me just get into an explanation of why I view it this way. Like I said previously, there's not a lot that happens in this book. It basically just centers around a bunch of uppity, privileged white people. There's literally only really one character of interest and diversity and that is Julius. He is their other friend from Brown and he is gay and he's also described to be Asian. I don't think the author even really takes time to really explain what his background is. I think she just kind of like calls him Asian. His gayness and his story I feel like is just used as a prop to add some sort of diversity to this book. He's described as being very flamboyant and sort of just like a caricature of what a gay person in New York City should be at this time. I don't know how many times I can reiterate this but I feel like Nothing happens in this 431 page book. The characters are just mind-numbingly privileged and they don't really take time to analyze the consequences of their actions and they sort of just flit from one thing to the next with no real intrigue. I think some people could argue that some stuff does happen, but what I'm really trying to say is that this book is boring and the characters are just so annoying and privileged that it makes it like really difficult to want to read about them. And like I said earlier, I like unlikable characters. That is not a problem for me, but I feel like there has to be a point. Like, why are you unlikable besides just being a vapid, brat. Also, I think the most enraging thing that Masood does with this book is in the last 50 fucking pages, she turns this into a 9-11 book. I kind of thought early on as I was reading it that it was weird that it took place in the early 2000s. I feel like she avoided saying up front that it was 2001 for a while until the very end when you kind of start to piece that together. I'm telling you, she like throws up a Hail Mary, like nothing's been happening in this whole book. And then out of the blue, 9-11 happens. And it's so weird that she does it at the end of the novel because everything you've been building up to with the characters, all of their you know personal dramas and their, their stupidness just sort of gets like thrown out the window and then she doesn't resolve any of the character conflict. It's just sort of like, oh my God, 9-11 happened and all the people are like, that's crazy. Cause obviously 9-11 is a huge deal and I find it a gross misuse of that tragedy to just throw it into your novel at the end and have it be just something that makes the characters go, huh, life is short and meh. Adding a random tragedy to the end of your book that has nothing really to do with the rest of it is like a big pet peeve of mine. And so I just, feel like it was so inappropriate to use it. And also 9-11 is so serious and you can't just like throw that around. Like that's weird. Also the writing of this book is un bearably verbose. This is where the pretentiousness really comes in. Side note about the author, she actually is also a Brown graduate and I feel like she wrote this book as an ode to her Brown education and she's sort of being like, look, I have an English degree and I'm so good at words. And so basically this book is just a series of run-on sentences that literally span like half the page. Like I'm not even kidding. They're like such long sentences and they're so hard to follow and understand. I feel like you have to have a dictionary next to you. I listened to the majority of this book on audio which I found very helpful because I read in a lot of other reviews that it was hard to follow even for people who are very intelligent. So I actually have an example of a sentence that I can share with you and I will also be saying the punctuation out loud so you can see just how long this sentence is and I probably am gonna stumble over it because it's so long. She, comma, who had felt she saw so clearly that it hurt, comma, had felt that the truth, comma, crystalline, comma, was, comma, with Murray, comma, granted her, parenthesis, though, not through his help, comma, or anything he did, colon, but just by his presence, semicolon, as though, comma, indeed, comma, he were but a part of her that had been lost, comma, a magnificent platonic epiphany repeated, comma, and daily repeated, colon, this, comma, surely, comma, was love, exclamation, parenthesis, comma, felt, comma, now, comma, that the weight of emotion lay like a veil, comma, a fine mist. I just counted 16 commas, two parentheses, one semicolon, and two colons in this sentence. And another thing that really bothered me about this book was the treatment of the character Booty. Like I said, I would get back to talking about them calling him Booty. His name is Frederick Tubb, but for some reason his mom and everyone calls him Booty. And so his character is described as being very large and overweight. And there's something about the treatment of this character that makes me feel like Masood hates fat people. She just has everyone treat this character so poorly and be so insulting to him that 
I feel like she's just trying to say something about her true feelings about overweight people. The name alone enrages me. Like who the fuck would call someone booty? Every time another character insults booty, his largeness is described as being like almost the worst thing you could be. Like every time someone talks to him, they're like, well, I've never been fat like you. I didn't realize you were gonna be so fat. Like constantly characters are talking to him like that, which is just, so annoying and so upsetting. And she also constantly brings up descriptions of him being sweaty and breathing heavily and kind of making people feel uncomfortable with his largeness because he's very tall and very big. And she doesn't just leave it at him being fat either. She also describes him as being creepy and he ends up being in love with his cousin Marina, which is just super weird. And I don't even understand why she did this with this character. I also thought her treatment of minorities was really weird. Like I said, Julius was written sort of as like a character of a flamboyant gay man. More than once she uses slurs to refer to Julius and his gayness. I don't want to repeat the word because I feel like that is a word that belongs to the gay community and they can use it as they see fit, but I don't think it's appropriate for me to use it and definitely not appropriate for Masood to write it into her book, especially when this is not on voices. There's also a very minor character who is black, who she describes in a way that was very troubling to me. He's not a huge part of the book. He only shows up, I think about twice. I wish I had a copy to read it exactly, but I remember her specifically referring to his skin as being like midnight. And she sort of says something along the lines of, I wrote it down, um, not American black, but a black from deep in Africa, which is just, really uncomfortable and really weird. And why would you say that? Like I said, I just found this book to be incredibly pretentious and I just don't know what she was trying to accomplish. She just overwrites everything and all of the characters feel very flat and two dimensional and their motivations are just really unclear. And like I said, she just sort of ends it on 9-11 and then the characters are kind of like, wow, life, what? I didn't like this book either. So again, I would think there's better ways to spend your time. Um, Goodreads was on to something again this book deserved its rating and I gave it one star. Honestly, it is so hot in my room right now and I'm getting really heated talking about these books because of like how much I did not enjoy them. And I'm telling you, I wanted this experiment to not go in this direction. I wanted to like these books. I wanted to be that person that's like, I don't know why this book has a 2.67 rating because it deserves five stars. But these three books that I've already mentioned just made it really hard. And then I moved on to the next book and so the next book on my list, I still have from the library and it is Four Blondes by Candace Bushnell. And this is another book that you might've heard of because she is the creator of Sex and the City, the original novel that the show is based on. And so you think to yourself, okay, like if this author has written a book that became such a critically acclaimed show, surely her writing isn't that bad. Four Blondes has almost 24,000 ratings and reviews, a 2.81 average rating, and 16% of those are one star. Basically, Four Blondes is an anthology that follows four blondes. It's not very creatively titled, and they're all told in slightly different styles. The first one is told in third person, and it centers around this girl named Janie, who used to be a model, and she every summer likes to vacation at the Hamptons, so she finds a different man every summer to vacation with, and she dates him, and so on and so forth. The second book, follows a journalist. I don't remember what her name is, but that story actually really follows her and her husband because his perspective is also taken into account. And it's also told in third person, but it's sort of like present tense-ish written. That was a good way to describe that. And then the third story is told in first person and centers around a socialite who has married a prince and she's sort of struggling with some like mental health stuff, which sounds interesting, but I'll get into why it's not later. And then the fourth story is also written in first person and it centers around a writer who goes to the UK to find a husband. The back says she chronicles the lives of four beautiful women as they face turning points in which each must choose between her passions. This book was also um, very confusing and appalling to me. I don't really understand what Candace Bushnell was trying to say. Bushnell relied very heavily on stereotypes of blondes and like their experiences being blonde. When I was reading this, I thought the first story was pretty poorly written. Um, kind of hard to follow. I didn't really like the main character who was the model. She was just very focused on money and, and wanting to get with the right guy who could like put her further in her future. And she didn't want to get a job. And every time someone tried to help her make something of herself, she was just like, no, I'm a feminist, even though I rely on men for my life. She, for, she had like a weird explanation of why she thought that was feminist. 
not trying to judge other women's feminism, but it, it was just confusing to me. I didn't really understand. But then as I kept going, the second and third story had me questioning which was the worst story. The fourth story kind of just felt like it was added on last minute. It didn't really bother me. It was just kind of random and honestly, it almost felt like an afterthought. It was definitely shorter. But the second story with the couple, the journalist, wife and husband, they just fight the whole time and they're so unhappy. And this is a personal thing, but I just don't really like depictions of super unhealthy marriages where they're like, not trying to work on it. I like to read stories about marriages and seeing the troubles of them. Like I really, really enjoy Landline by Rainbow Rowell that examines marriage. This one was just kind of like, they were very competitive and they were very rude to each other and they were like malicious. And, it, and there was just like, wasn't really an explanation for it besides that they were just terrible people. They literally slut shamed so much in that story. The girl character kept talking about how women that dressed slutty or like slept with lots of men were just like sluts and whores. And she just like, kept using that kind of language to describe other women. So I also didn't really understand the second character's like feminism. The third story about the socialite princess was just really weird because her mental health was like on another level. She was very paranoid and she suffered from an eating disorder. Her treatment of characters and the way she was treated throughout the story was just very odd. Again, I just like, don't understand what we were trying to do with this book. Like, I'm sure people like this exist in the world, but I'm not really sure why we want to read about it. Like, I don't know. If the Sex in the City book is anything like this, I'm shocked that it got published and that it became such an award-winning television show. Like, I've seen episodes of that show. Like, it's not my favorite show, but I have laughed or thought it was enjoyable and I could even see their feminism a little bit more than the ones in this. Again, I'm not trying to judge, I'm just very confused. If anyone's read this and wants to explain it to me, feel free. Also, like I said in the third story, the princess was suffering from an eating disorder, but I feel like to a degree, all the characters in this book had some sort of like body dysmorphia because Candace Bushnell took every opportunity she could to weight shame. It was like a side character was too fat. The main character was too thin. This character was this, this character was that. There was like just constant attention brought to what women's bodies looked like in this book. In my Goodreads review, I actually included quotes from the book that show from all the different stories, a lot of the weight shaming and unhealthy disordered eating and like just the things that they were dealing with. They were like addicted to exercise and they just constantly talked about how much they weigh. And there was like a lot of numbers and like body fat percentages that were written into the book, which sound really weird. I don't wanna read them aloud right now, just in case anyone would be triggered by that. So if you do wanna see examples from the book directly, you can look at my Goodreads review. But again, I don't recommend reading that if that's something that would bother you or upset you. But I don't recommend this book for someone who struggles with those things because they were so improperly handled in this book. And it just, it just blew my mind. Again, I just don't understand what Candace Bushnell wanted to tell with this story. The back of the book says, studded with Bushnell's trademark wit and stiletto heel sharp insights, Four Blonde serves up the zeitgeist and mores of our era with gossipy scandalous verve. Even if these were the views of early 2000s, I just feel like it was really unhealthy to write the book this way. Like just so much shaming. I just didn't have a good time with this book. I don't really know what else to say about it. I don't recommend it. It deserves its low rating. And again, I gave it one star. I gave all of these books one star. So yeah, I don't recommend that. I'm just trying to calm down now after talking about all of these books. This is why I have been kind of delayed in posting my wrap ups because it took me a while to get through those four books and I didn't want to do my wrap ups and talk about the books I was reading before doing this video. So you'll see my wrap up coming up very soon for both March and April because I actually read a lot of other books that I really enjoyed during those months. So look forward to some positivity in those. I didn't go into this experiment trying to be super negative. I really wanted to disprove some of these Goodreads ratings, but unfortunately for these four books, I definitely agree. I think they all kind of deserve low ratings and all of them had some sort of problematic content in them. They were just like, why did you write this? If any of you are still super interested in me doing more of this experiment, I actually have a list of four more books that fall just below the criteria I gave with 10,000 to 15,000 reviews and ratings. And so I definitely could read those books as well. I'm willing to try again to try and like beat the system and be like, please, a book with a low rating that doesn't deserve a low rating. I will link the Goodreads list that I got these books from down below. Like I said, I was really rooting for there to be an underdog, but there just wasn't. But yeah, that's pretty much it for this experiment. Again, let me know what you thought down below. And thank you all so much for watching. You're all beautiful. Have a nice day.